The Atheist Debates Patreon Project presents an interview with Mohammed Syed, President, Ex-Muslims of North America. All right, so thanks so much for joining us here today. We, we happen to be in Pennsylvania at this convention. I'm thrilled to have you here. Why don't, before we get started, why don't you tell everybody who you are and what you do? Um, I'm Mohammed Syed. I'm one of the founders of Ex-Muslims of North America. I'm currently the president. We are a group that's trying to organize ex-Muslims and change the dynamic where most people that leave Islam are alone. So, and we see that a lot, you know, coming out of any religion, yeah. where you, you risk losing your entire social structure. And so, you know, I'm, I'm really happy for the work that you guys are doing and recovering from religion and other organizations filling those gaps. Um, what, we, what I've been doing with this project is kind of talking about debates and the value of debates, and I'm not just a big public formal debate, but one-on-one -on -one as well. Yeah. And uh, the only other time we've had a conversation that was specifically or tailored to Islam was when uh, Hina Dadaboy was on, and we talked about it a little bit. Yeah. Um, I thought I'd go ahead and, and just ask some questions and we can talk about uh, what we have to do differently. You know, when, okay. I, when, I, when I talk about these things, I tend to focus where my expertise is on Christianity and yeah. bi the Bible. Uh, but there's also a lot of general arguments yeah, for exactly. the existence that are of God. identical that and are, okay. are convincing. I actually was talking a few weeks ago with somebody from Iraq mm -hmm. that left Islam because of watching you. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, so if, we're, if we run across a friend, a coworker, uh, you know, who's a Muslim, and we want to actually have the conversation. How much do we actually need to know about Islam, about the Quran, before we engage at all? I don't think you need to know anything, really. Um, one general assumption you can make is the larger narrative of the Bible is also the narrative of the Quran, from the perspective of uh, the ancient Israel and the patriarchs and creationism, all of that exists within Islam. So. The, the general arguments for the existence of God that don't actually get into doctrines, things like the Kalam cosmological argument that William Lane Craig uses a lot, that has its foundations, or that version has its yeah. foundations in Islam. Do, is it even necessary to know a great deal about the formal arguments, or can you just have a conversation and, and ask, you know, tell me what you believe and why type of thing? Um. I would say you don't need the formal arguments because for a lot of Muslims, they have never encountered doubt. So for a lot of people, encountering doubt alone and forcing them to reevaluate their beliefs and why they believe what they believe goes a long way. Um, if you ask them to question Christianity or question Hinduism or question other religions, they'll be comfortable doing that. But then ask, take those same arguments that they used and ask them how do they not apply to their religion. And that will usually dumbfound them to begin with. So uh, one of the problems that I run across is uh, I'm not as studied uh, on the topic. And you know, I know we don't necessarily need to be, uh, but I'd like to be. No, it definitely helps because it helps you with apologetics. You understand why their arguments are wrong and you can poke holes in them much more easily. So when addressing specific passages in the Quran or uh, how much in Christianity, there's over a thousand different denominations, and every church has its, its own understanding mm -hmm. of everything. And normally when we hear about Islam, it gets divided into a couple of discrete categories. But how varied are the interpretations? Um, I would say they're similarly varied. There are lots and lots of sects and subsects, and even a lot of Muslims don't know about them because of the fact that they're persecuted and, uh, and diversity is really not acknowledged because it's a negative thing. Mm -hmm. um, I know people from Saudi Arabia that told me that Besides, uh, Shiism and Sunnism, no other sex exists, while there are literally hundreds of them. So on one occasion, I had uh, the chance to speak to somebody, and we were having a discussion about whether or not Islam uh, endorses death penalty for blasphemy. Mm -hmm. And they would cite a particular passage. And I went and you know looked around, and I found another passage where it seems very clear yeah that it does you know, do this. And what I get in response is, well, you're not reading it in the original Arabic and it loses something in translation. How do you, I mean, and obviously you don't have that problem, but how, how should I deal with that? Um, actually, I have the problem too, because I'm from Pakistan. We speak Urdu, it's a different language. But even most Arab speaking speakers will have a problem with that because this is classical Arabic, it's called fusha. And 
the average Arab speaks uh, sort of the Egyptian dialect. It's not common. They wouldn't understand at all. And that is a n n negative for Muslims in the sense of you're making an argument that this book was revealed as a universal book for everybody, but nobody can understand it anymore. It reminds me of trying to read Shakespeare, you know, yeah. the, how much English has changed in just a few hundred years, and then you've got similar changes in every language. Yeah. Languages die out. And so telling somebody that, you know, well, you didn't read it in the original language, well, maybe I don't understand it, but hasn't this changed as much? And isn't there a, a, another issue, which is if this is a revelation from God, why would it matter what language and why would God reveal something in languages that change and die out? Yeah, so it's basically an argument for a very small God that isn't available or accessible to other people. So, one other thing regarding the sure. same thing is that um, you're also making the argument that um, it's, uh, Arabic or the Quranic Arabic in particular can't be translated. Prove that. The burden of proof lies on the person making that claim. And they've never thought that through. They simply usually believe that my argument alone is enough. Right. What evidence do you have to present in support of your case? Because the entire purpose of having language is to convey a concept. And if your language can't convey a concept and if you can't translate this into another language, uh, that means God made a mistake problem. and chose a wrong language. If, if you can linguistically prove that Arabic can be translated, then God made a mistake. Well, or he only wanted certain people to be able to understand it. But that's against the Quran. Like, uh, Islamically, Islam is for everybody. It should be spread to everybody because it's the, the final revelation. So what mistakes do you see people making when they're trying to have conversations, whether it's one-on-one -on -one or you know, just an online message uh, about Islam? Um, so one thing is uh, right-wing talking points. Um, somebody mentioned taqiyah, which is um, deliberately misleading in order to spread Islam. That is not a general Islamic concept. Um, the only relevant or related item is if you're being persecuted, you can lie to save your life. Um, similarly, um, a few right-wing sources um, talk about uh, Muhammad being a pedophile. That isn't historically accurate either. Yes, he had a uh, child bride, but that was common in the 7th century and throughout history until very recently. Um, when you use those sorts of arguments, you will turn somebody off entirely and they won't want to continue having that conversation. Um, a better argument regarding the exact same issue is that if today you're willing to acknowledge a 21st century person that marrying a nine-year-old is not okay, why didn't God foresee that, that throughout time? Yeah, why, why wasn't it clear that this was immoral, just I, as immoral then, and they weren't aware of it? Yeah, exactly. So either you have to admit in the 21st century that it is moral to marry a nine-year-old, and if you have a nine-year-old relative, then marrying a 50-year-old, you have to be morally okay with that. Or God and our morality changed over time, which is not compatible with Islam. This is along the same lines that we, that I deal with uh, the issue of slavery in the Bible because one of the responses is to say, well, it was moral at the time, but now it's not. And I, I wait, if, if God's unchanging and God is the source of morality, how did something change? And if it did change, you know, if we're willing to acknowledge now that slavery is wrong, why couldn't they see it back then? And why couldn't, oh, well, God had to talk to them in terms they could understand. Oh, but wait, a, God. He's, he's God. If he can tell you not to eat shellfish, sure, certainly he can tell you not to own people. Yeah, exactly. So Islamically, uh, Muhammad or God could ban alcohol. He had his own flying horse that went to space, but banning slavery was a step too far. Mm -hmm. So there's another topic that comes up frequently, uh, or maybe not as, as frequently as some of us might think, uh, and that is that where do we draw the lines between criticizing the Quran, mm -hmm. criticizing Islam, criticizing particular dogmas or schools or theocratic positions, and actually attacking Muslims where you might be charged with Islamophobia. Where do we draw those lines? Um, don't make any normative, uh, essentializing sort of statements that Muslims are anything. Same as any group of people, people in Pennsylvania. There are a whole variety of people in Pennsylvania. The same with Muslims are liberal, Muslims are Muslims that um, and this is controversial among Muslims themselves that don't believe the Quran is divine, but they still identify as Muslims. Um, regarding challenging the Quran or challenging Muhammad or any of those narratives, chances are um, if you challenge anything that's held dear, um, people will react badly to it. And so they will charge you with, uh, they will be angry with you, they'll charge you with racism or any other charge they can throw your way. But 
you need to be firm on the fact that I'm challenging an idea. I'm not saying you subscribe to all of these ideas because mm -hmm. most Muslims don't subscribe to all of the bad ideas within the Quran. They don't subscribe to slavery, for example. They don't subscribe to marrying nine-year-olds, but they still hold entirety of it as being sacred, sanct, and perfect. There was a, there's a video I saw that was recently reposted of uh, a meeting in the UK where they begin to ask these people, you know, you're, you're not extremists, you're not terrorists, but do you support, you know, the stoning of women? And there's like universally raising their hands. Yeah. Um, how, how accurate is a video like that? I mean, we talked about not making these normalizing yeah. statements, but it certainly applies to the people in that group, which was surprising. So the issue is, it's more prevalent than you would encounter in the US. So there's more group thing, more people that, if you've never been challenged about something, you don't think about it deeply. Even regarding Aisha and nine year, being nine years old, if you haven't thought about the ramifications of this, that somebody can take this, if you say it's divine, and apply laws, and children will suffer as a result. In Yemen, um, the law, the minimum age was 18, and it was lower to nine recently because of the fact that Islamically, you can't have that law, it goes against uh, Islam. So have them think through the entire process. So what started, I mean, how, how did you get from A to B? Uh, how did you find your way free? And what sort, what are the best arguments? And it, it may, may not even be an argument. Yeah. What, what is the best tactic that, that anyone could use uh, to have a productive conversation with someone who's perhaps trapped in Islam and, and not even aware of it? Um, point out the fact that they probably aren't well educated in Islam themselves. Most people, Christians, Muslims, Jews, anybody, listen to what they're told by their priests, by their parents, and accept it. They never actually go and investigate what it, act, what it says. Um, I did the same thing. Um, I believe that Islam was rational, was scientific, and there are miracles in the Quran and everything else. But when I actually sat down and started going through it on my own, I, I was able to figure out why, where these come from. So one of the things that people often talk about is embryology. That comes from the Greek, from Galen. So there, mo pretty much everything that I ascribe to Islam was untrue. It was told to me by people whose parents or other priests told them. So point out how you're unwilling, they may be unwilling to accept arguments coming from other people without actually going to primary sources themselves. If, if religion and God and divinity is the most important thing ever, don't they owe it to themselves to go and fact check for them and look up the sources? It's, it's this process of what would it take to actually change your mind? Yeah. And that's a question that we, we get asked a lot, but of course there's a, there's a difference in that they're accepting a proposition and we're not accepting it. So yeah. what would it take to change my mind is a demonstration that it's true. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I get into discussions where I'm, I'm trying to find out, tell me why it is that you believe. And quite often people aren't even able to take the first step to tell me what they believe, yeah. or at least not very clearly. Um, One other topic that may be useful is that a lot of the history of Islam uh, came much later. So people presume that we know certain things. We know the minutia of Muhammad's life, the minutia of everything that happened, but all of that was recorded over a hundred years later. And so it's third and fourth hand, and we're trusting that knowledge to people um, that obviously would have human biases um, if you're talking about the Iraq war today and 100 years later you're going through a chain of narrations of Republicans versus Democrats versus pro and anti-war, you will see differences in the, how people relate that thing. And you had 100 years of multiple civil wars and conquests and dynasties coming and going. And a after that point, all of this was written down. So to presume that there will be no um, human element in there is not rational. Yeah, we're, the, the winners write history, yeah. and that's not actually even true either. Some historians write, and then you, you take your, your bits and pieces from different things. I find that quite often we'll run into conspiracy theorists who uh, weave together yeah. a handful of facts and construct a narrative that at the surface is compelling, as long yeah. as you don't dig too deep. And I wonder how much of that goes into the, the storytelling that becomes the tradition in religions, both you know, Christianity, yeah. Islam, whatever. Um, as a uh, privileged, rather protected, you know, middle-aged white guy in the United States, I was asked the other day, um, because we're, we're this, the anniversary of 9-11 just happened, and I was on a podcast and someone asked me, um, is Islam the most dangerous religion in the world? And 
before I tell you what I said, I thought I'd get your view and the kind of why behind it. I think that's, uh, I wouldn't make a blanket statement. So is, are the most people in the world currently affected by the negatives within Islam? Sure. But how do you quantify what is the most dangerous and on what basis is the most dangerous? Um, irrationality, there are more irrational religions out there. Um, from a human impact perspective, I would agree, because there are one and a half billion people that are impacted by Islam. Yeah, I went, I went a similar route, not only with the number of people, but with the government influence, the theocratic yeah. control that Islam has over some nations. Um, you know, we saw what happened in the Dark Ages when, when Christianity ruled, and, and we've kind of worked through that. Um, and I've, that's the norm. Yeah. I, I've made the statement before, and I, I could be completely wrong, so I'm, I'm interested to kind of get your take on this, that um, looking at Christianity, reading the Bible, uh, I see every opportunity for it to be uh, as dangerous, as vile, yeah. as, as any other religion, if not more than some others. And from my perspective, it appears that Christianity is not today what it once was, and it seemed to have been kind of dragged kicking and screaming out of the Dark Ages by Enlightenment principles, by in interaction with other religions and secular principles. And that what we, what we see, we need to be aware, we're, we're of course getting news, yeah. a, not an unbiased source, there's sensationalizing going on there. But what we do see from Islam today in the world um, is not remarkably worse than what we may have seen from Christianity and it may just be this is a younger religion that has maintained its control over local governments and where are we going to be in you know three four five hundred years I don't think it's an, about age in the sense that um, in the past Islam was more progressive than Christianity in the 11th century 10th century um, to a certain extent it's uh, pulling inwards of Islam, Islam scholarship died for various reasons um, and it could also be chalked up to accidents of history. Um, certain religious uh, reasons prevented the printing press from proliferating in the Muslim world. The Ottoman Empire banned the printing press. There, was is there were issues with job losses, and there were issues with printing holy texts in Arabic. And therefore, there was a 300-year delay, delay in the printing press being adopted by the Ottomans and the Mughals. And that alone would explain uh, a civilization falling back. Um, there was a uh, philosophy was rejected at a broad scale. There were lo a lot of different currents were going on that could have been the other way around as well. It could have been the Muslim world who could have advanced in the 14th century and been where we are today. So your work with ex-Muslims in North America, um, you're, you're focused on people leaving Islam, yeah. perhaps losing their social structure, um, interacting with them, giving, you know, providing them with the community that they need and yeah. perhaps a voice. But what about worldwide? Yeah. What can we do? Because uh, it's not like I can just pack up and, you know, go to Bangladesh and start saving the atheist bloggers that they're killing. Yeah. Uh, what, what can we do and, and where should we be focusing our attentions? Um, so what you're doing right now is amazing because it does help people everywhere. Um, but that's the benefit of the internet. Um, in my opinion, that's the game changer that will change everything globally. Um, Richard Dawkins' books are available in various parts of the world, illegally, PDFs, whatever, and that does change my mind. I've talked to people in many, many countries that have left religion because of Western atheist literature. Um, so we need to keep producing that, but we also need to focus on the problems within Islam because one of the issues is that um, people look at it as a the problems within Christianity, because from an Islamic perspective, Christianity is flawed, so of course they'll find all of these problems. But uh, there needs to be a concerted effort to have scholarship pointing out the flaws within Islam, within Muhammad's life, within the way the histories of uh, the Muslim world are written, and um, the violence that occurred throughout Islamic history as well. So um, I was mentioning earlier um, about slavery. Um, the Arab slave trade was longer lasting, more brutal, had more victims than the Atlantic slave trade. Um, we don't talk about it. The Muslim world obviously doesn't talk about it. They're, they prefer brushing it under the rug that it never happened, even though in Saudi Arabia it was a ban 50 years ago. Um, so we need to highlight what happened in all of these cultures. And um, once the truth is out there, it's hard to continue believing. So exposing the truth and working to empower voices that are actual reformists. So you, you have a lot of voices, uh, Muslim voices, and even some 
uh, I would say, fake liberal voices that are trying to make Islam seem peaceful and wonderful um, instead of actually uh, addressing the root problem that religion overall, whenever it interacts with the state, whenever people believe in any dogma uncritically, bad things happen. And we need everybody in the world to look at everything rationally and, and challenge every assumption. And the world, that is how the world has always advanced. So last question, we talked about the, the benefit of the internet and the access to information and educating people is, is the key to solving almost anything. Uh, what I do, you know, between having the conversations and the debates and what, what this project is actually about, it's teaching people how to have the conversations more effectively. And it's great to have you here to talk about some of that. But what, what is the role of big public formal debates? Are people in uh, predominantly Islamic nations, are they even going to be able to see those things? Are, is there an interest in them? I see some uh, imams who are... Uh, seem to want to engage. There, there's a there's a gentleman whose name I've forgotten who began his talk about how he loves the atheists because uh, the Quran says no God but Allah and atheists say no God so they're halfway there, which is a really clever word game, yeah. but I don't know that it does anything. Yeah. See, is there room for these debates or are we really still talking about something that's so closed down that there's no way we're likely to share a stage and directly challenge the ideas. Um, the issue is that a lot of Muslims understand that they will lose that debate, so they don't want to have it. Um, so there's a prominent preacher, Zakir Naik, in Dubai. Um, he's got millions of followers. Um, many people have tried to have him have a debate. He's refused because he's usually spouting things that the average eighth grade science student can debunk. And uh, since the people want to believe and there's the level of education isn't that good. People believe what he's saying. So I would say that, yes, we need to engage the, whoever we can find as a willing partner on the other side to debate these things. There are lots of Muslims. Myself, 10 years ago, would be more than happy to debate because I had moral certitude. And like I believe that Islam was right and true. And no matter what argument you throw my way, I would prove you wrong. There are lots of people like that out there. So I, definitely there is room for that debate to happen. Great. Well, thanks so much for doing this, and keep doing uh, your work with ex-Muslims in North America. Thank you for having me. Sure. This video is made possible by supporters of the Atheist Debates Patreon project. You can find more information and add your support at patreon.com slash atheistdebates.